Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. I'm so grateful for Toast, our primary technology partner at our barbecue restaurants for believing in this project, for believing in the project of smartphone storytelling and digital hospitality, for giving us the stage to reach millions of fans all over the world through audio, video, words, and images. We're so excited because today we have Meredith Sandland, who is the CEO of Empower Delivery. Now, Meredith is a very special guest because we've had her on our other podcast, Digital Hospitality, for her first book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, which I have here in my hands. It is the number nice. one book that I recommend. She wrote it with Carl Orsborn, co-author. Um, it's the number one book that I recommend on this show and every show that we do to restaurant owners that are ready to get involved with digital hospitality, what we call digital hospitality. Meredith, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I love the tabs on your book. It is well loved. I like to <laughs> well see loved. that. Yes, yeah. well loved. Well, we learn through lessons and stories and you have so many stories, not just in that book, um, but the new book as well as your new position. So we would love to, to start off and let's talk about how did you become appointed the CEO of Empower Delivery and what is Empower Delivery? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start with what it is. So Empower Delivery is a restaurant software company. Uh, it is a software that is meant specifically for delivery centric kitchens. So these would be restaurants that are doing primarily delivery. They might be ghost kitchens. Uh, they might be kind of a hybrid kitchen that is doing uh, mostly delivery and a little bit of um, on-site or pickup takeout type style. And um, it is fully, fully optimized therefore for delivery. And I think what you find in the software world is that things do best what they are meant for. And what folks in the delivery world have been trying to do is cluge together software that is really good software. It just wasn't meant for specifically solving the off-premise delivery problem. And because Empower Delivery was designed to do that, it works very well for that purpose. So we're going to go to my favorite random question, which is where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Oh my goodness. Stadium, stage, or venue. Wow. That's a good one. Um, I'm going to say the gorge outside Seattle. The probably. gorge. Okay. Yeah. How many people fit at the gorge? Gosh, I don't know. I haven't been there in a while. I'm going to say probably 20,000. 20,000. Okay. We're going to go yeah. to the gorge. I'm going to convince entrepreneur and toast and empower <laughs> and a bunch of incredible sponsors, but we're going to fill 20,000 of the best of the best hospitality professionals. Now I'm That's very lucky amazing. to be, I'm very lucky to have Meredith because she is a renowned world-class speaker. She has uh, been on all the stages, not just in the United States, but internationally um, talking about not just the ideas in her book, but the work that she's done before. But I'd love to, to set the stage for you here at the Gorge in front of the 20,000 of the best executives and the best leaders of tomorrow in the hospitality business. And give me two minutes, two minutes of your your journey of how did you get from your first step into hospitality and then looking back to how did you get the opportunity where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. So I came into restaurants by accident, which I think is how most people get into restaurants. Uh, most people, I think, start in high school or college, you know, doing something on the side and then end up falling in love with it and stay in it. Uh, I started a little bit later. Um, I was a consultant and I got hired by Taco Bell to go work in their strategy and finance department. And I thought, oh, I'll, do, I'll go try this out and learn about it. And I got into it and fell in love with it. And, you know, part of that was because I had these amazing people that I was working for, uh, Greg Creed, who's uh, then the CEO of Taco Bell and subsequently of Yum, amazing, amazing individual and a woman named Melissa Laura, who at the time was the CFO at Taco Bell. Part of it was because you're just solving such interesting problems that have immediate practical effect on everyone's day-to-day -day lives, right? So, so many people eat at restaurants, specifically eat at Taco Bell, and uh, what you do and your job shows up in the world immediately, which is really, really neat. 
Um, and part of it was because at the time Taco Bell was going through such an enormous transformation, which now the entire industry is going through. And that's really what's kept me in it is all of this transformation in the restaurant industry is so fascinating and creates so many opportunities to really change the way that Americans eat every day. So I'm curious, when you first got into this business and you were a, a young professional, how did you find your voice? Because we have so many, there, what, what, what's confusing about the hospitality business is that we think that there's only one job type you know, it's kind of like I'm actually serving the food, but there's so many different career paths where we can make an impact. When you were a young professional, is there a story that you have of of speaking up and finding your voice that actually propelled your career forward? Yeah, I think what I care uh, most about in the restaurant industry or the angle that I come at it from is around the business model or the concept. How do you do what you do so well that not only are consumers happy, but your company is also profitable. And when, when you really deliver on that consumer experience and make it great, uh, it turns out that you become profitable. And companies that try to do the opposite, which is be profitable so that they can serve consumers, typically don't do very well. They don't succeed. Uh, they might outright fail, go away. They certainly don't scale. And so I love that magic of trying to figure out what is going to make the consumer really, really happy, want to come back all the time and be frankly thrilled that they're giving you money that uh, results in your company uh, being profitable. So that problem to me is very, very interesting. I think about everything, therefore, through a financial lens. Uh, and I ended up as a result in a new unit development, which uh, at the time, I would say was a very male dominated uh, portion of the restaurant industry. And I think the restaurant industry has a reputation for being male dominated overall. So to say that about development was very specifically male dominated. Um, and so I came into this organization with a bunch of guys who were quite a bit older than I was. I had people on my team who had, had been at Taco Bell longer than I had been alive. <laughs> And, uh, you know, just started asking questions, started asking, you know, why do we do it this way? Couldn't it be like that? Um, what, what if we wanted to? And as I was asking those questions, I realized there's a very um, consistent theme throughout all of them, which was how do we make the QSR experience great? And how do we make it modern for a consumer. Now at the time, all this delivery stuff didn't exist. And so modern for the consumer meant, you know, making it a place that people actually wanted to be, making it easier to use, making it more urban friendly, uh, whether that was an inline unit or even in suburbia, pulling the units closer to the street uh, to help the cities feel more urban in nature. Uh, just a lot of things that um, were about making the consumer happy, but also making the asset fit into modern life uh, in a much better way. And it turns out that when you start pulling on that thread, like everything in the restaurant industry, one piece is related to another. You can't just fix one thing. You have to do it all together. And if you want to change how the asset looks, then you have to change your asset supply chain. And if you want to change your asset supply chain, then you might have to change some of your cooking methods. If you're changing your cooking methods, you've got to retrain your team, right? Everything all works together. Uh, and you really have to bring all pieces of the business together, which is what makes restaurateurs such interesting people, right? Because they're wearing an HR hat, they're wearing a culinary hat, they're wearing an operations hat, they're wearing a marketing hat, and now today also a technology hat. So my my grandfather, he raised me and he he taught me to stay curious, to get involved and to ask for help. And what you're talking about, this curiosity, it's one thing to be curious. It's another thing to have the courage to ask the questions when you're in those rooms. And I think so much of when I think about this show and the impact that we want to have on the industry is we need to ask more questions and we need to ask them more often, especially at the rate, rate of change that things are happening. Do you remember who was your inspiration or was there a coach, a mentor, a teacher maybe that said, hey, Meredith, raise your hand? Or were you always the girl that sat in front of the class and stayed after class and did the extra went the extra mile 
Well, I've certainly always been a nerd, if that's what you're asking. Uh, <laughs> wasn't asking that. I definitely wasn't asking that. Is that is very consistent theme in my life. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I dedicated the first book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant. Um, I dedicated that to a woman named Melissa Laura, who was the CFO at Taco Bell at the time, the woman who hired me at Taco Bell. And I think... She taught me certainly about the restaurant industry and how it works, but she also taught me about the value of uh, really focusing your questions on things that move the needle and uh, really drilling deep into those things that would fundamentally change the business um, and then letting other things go where you need to accept that they are the way they are and they're not that important, right? And for a nerd, actually, that's quite hard to do. You want to drill deep into everything, <laughs> um, it turns out, but that's not always a great idea. And so she really helped me learn which levers in the business were going to affect it the most. So for the restaurant owners that are listening that are curious about ghost kitchens and virtual brands, can you give us a, a ghost kitchen breakdown? Why why ghost kitchens and how did you find the opportunity at Kitchen United um, when it first got presented to you? Why was it an aha moment for you? Yeah. Okay. So I left Taco Bell for Kitchen United and what had happened was uh, we were uh, you know building all these Taco Bells. And about halfway through the journey of building a thousand Taco Bells, I looked around and said, hey, why are we building all these Taco Bells next to malls when no one goes to malls anymore? That seems strange. And they're all doing very well. They're um, profitable and fine, but it kind of planted a seed for me. And that seed grew when we tried to enter Manhattan. And I thought, why are we paying the world's highest real estate prices when 40% of the sales go out the door delivery? And uh, my head of architecture and I looked at each other and said, gosh, it'd be so cool if there was just like a commissary that we could deliver tacos out of rather than, you know, building this whole fancy building. And so fast forward a few years when I met the guys at Kitchen United, the seed had grown, right? And I walked in and I saw this place and I thought, oh my gosh, they're making the thing that I as the customer wish existed. Yeah, And that doesn't happen very often in your career. So uh, I went over and joined them and uh, their style of ghost kitchen uh, is one that has multiple suites. Um, they rent those suites to other operators. And so for operators, it's a very low cost way of getting into uh, kitchen space. Uh, but at the same time, they put those kitchens, they're very well located. They're about, you know, where are the consumers that you're delivering to? And they also have a front of house that enables takeout. Uh, because I think we all know selling things direct uh, has much better margins than selling things third party. And so having consumers do what I'll call self-delivery tends to be uh, a very profitable way of doing things. So we designed that business model uh, to do that for those reasons. Um, They've since gone on to do an incredible partnership with Kroger, as well as a number of others, uh, which really puts that asset front and center in front of consumers, which is which is great. And uh, that would be one style of ghost kitchen. Another style of ghost kitchen would be cluster truck. And cluster truck is the parent that Empower Delivery, the software company that I'm working for now, uh, spun out of. And Cluster Truck is totally different from how Kitchen United approaches it. What Cluster Truck does is put multiple virtual brands inside of one single kitchen. So it's a multi-concept integrated kitchen. And then they're vertically integrated, meaning they have the real estate, they have the brands, they have the operations, um, all in one thing. They have 1099 drivers attached to that site, very vertically integrated. And as a result, uh, everything goes out the door delivery, 100% delivery, um, unlike Kitchen United, where a lot of it is uh, takeout. And um, as everything goes out the door delivery, uh, they are able to make the economics of that work through their vertical integration and then through the software and how the software contributes to the business. I would love, I mean, I was fortunate to meet uh, Chris Baggett, the CEO of Cluster Truck. Um, you guys came out to Cali Barbecue and we had this incredible conversation, you know, when you're 
talking to an entrepreneur and I'm fortunate to, to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of founders, um, a lot of people with big ideas and great ideas. Uh, very rarely do you find people that are executing those ideas in real time. Um, I was so fortunate to, to find somebody like him that was willing to bust out his tablet and literally show me real time data of what was happening within this concept. And I think, you know, when I think of the internet and I think of digital hospitality, and I think of restaurants thinking bigger than just the four walls of their restaurant and selling in their village and in their city. It's how do we become e-commerce companies? How do we become media companies? How do we add additional revenue streams that will make us more profitable? You know, the problems we work so hard in this business, you know, as single unit restaurant owners and multi-unit restaurant owners, everybody across the chain from the dishwasher to the host, to the server, to the general managers and executives in between is how do we build better businesses into the future and more sustainable businesses? What, what Chris showed me, it was eye-opening. I mean, it was really eye-opening to see somebody with his intelligence, not just on a theory level, but actually putting the playbook and then creating this company, which is, I believe in it so much that I'm empowering cluster truck, my business to use this software. I mean, it, for me, it's inspirational because that's what we're doing at, at Cali barbecue. We're literally trying to create a barbecue media company, but we want to give it away to everybody. <laughs> and we want to be on as many platforms as possible. So these are the answers to the test. We don't have them all, but we failed here. We succeeded here, but here's the playbook. And like, that's really what Chris has, has, has provided what was your click? I mean, you're writing books, literally your thesis, your and Carl's thesis about all of this incredible things that are happening at such a exponential rate. What was your aha moment saying like, you already had that aha moment with virtual with, with, with yeah. Kitchen United. Yeah. You're like, is That's this right. actually happening twice? <laughs> How could it happen twice in one career? It's amazing. <laughs> And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to share an exciting new offer from our sponsor, Atmosphere TV. Go to atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ to not only get Atmosphere TV for free, but also our audience is given the gift of $200 in ad credits, as well as free activation. Join more than 40,000 other venues who use Atmosphere TV by signing up with the code BBQ at atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ. Keep guests entertained with Atmosphere TV because you have the ability to turn your promotions and your advertisements onto your television with this platform. The simple plug and play device lets you take control of the content on your screens. Keep guests entertained, engaged, and informed of real-time specials, career opportunities, and announcements that you can personalize within your own custom content dashboard. Tap into great channels such as America's Funniest Home Videos, Fashion, Throttle, Chive TV, Sports Highlights, Red Bull, Real Madrid, along with unbiased news and entertainment. There is something for everyone. Over 60 curated channels of short form, entertaining content to choose from right at your fingertips. They also have an incredible ad supported network that allows you to not only market within your four walls, but also locally or nationally if you desire. The platform gives you full control to dial in your marketing efforts. Please go and visit atmosphere.tv slash BBQ and let them know restaurant influencers sent you. And it is really what happened. I've known Chris for six years. I met him very early on in this uh, digital restaurant journey. And I've had the same reaction to him that you have, which is, wow, this incredibly smart person who's completely open book. He will share with you what worked, what didn't work, what they tried, what they wish they had tried, what they're going to try next. He will talk about all of it and share with you the outcome of it so that everyone in the industry can level up, which is uh, really, really incredible. So I've known him for a long time. I think he's incredibly smart. Actually became an investor in Cluster Truck because I believe in what they're doing. And uh, just as the highest volume, most profitable ghost kitchen in America, you look at that and you go, they figured something else yeah. out here that yeah. no one else has, right? Uh, but what changed for me was um, he said, you know, come, come see what we're doing in person. And so I did, I went to Indianapolis, which is where they're located. And I walked in to the kitchen. It's an $8 million kitchen doing over a thousand orders a day, all delivery. Unbelievable. And it's many of those orders, like a significant portion 
are group orders. And so they're, you know, five, 10, 15, 60 items in a, in an order, right? It's just an incredible volume of food going out the door. And, um, you think to yourself, okay, something that's that high volume doing that many dishes must be totally madhouse. Right. I mean, it just, you imagine it must be crazy. Like I know yeah. how a Taco Bell is tuned. And if I tried to push $8 million through a Taco Bell, it would break. <laughs> right. Like it's just, it's not going to happen. What's the average yeah. unit volume for a Taco Bell? Uh, I think it's about one eight. One eight. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's a significant, some, that's a significant yeah. increase. Yeah. I it's think there's some tilt. high volume units. <laughs> there's certainly some high volume units at the, at the tail end of that, but it's none get up to eight. Um, you know, a Chick-fil-A is tuned a little bit higher, but it's, yep. it's tuned to do that. Right. Yep. And it only does one thing. It's a very, very straightforward, Correct. very simple Correct. menu. Um, anyway, this menu is incredibly complicated. They're serving things as different as a breakfast burrito and Indian food. Right. And you think, how, how is this happening? It must be crazy in there. And I walked in to the kitchen and it was silent. Everyone was just jamming away on their music, doing their thing, just cooking in the zone. And I thought, what is happening here? This is amazing. Well, it's silent because the software is telling everybody what to do. Instead of having an expo standing there, yelling for different things, telling people when to do things, asking where something is, the software is telling all of the line cooks, this is what's important at this moment, do this now. And as a result, they just do that thing and then move to the next thing. And they're not aware of the backlog behind them. They don't have the stress of knowing that there's 30 orders in the queue that they can't do anything about. They literally only have in front of them what they need to be working on, which is amazing. So that was the first thing I noticed. The second thing I said was, how many pieces of software are you using to run this place? And they said, three. We use our own software. We use NetSuite for accounting. And we use seven shifts for labor scheduling because we can't do that. Shout out. And shout I said, out. yeah, shout, shout out to seven shifts. We love, yeah. we love seven shifts. I know, right? Yes. And I said, okay, so most restaurants who are doing something as complex and omni-channel and, and digital as you are, use 15 to 20 different pieces of software to make it happen. They're stitching all these things together to try to figure out, how, like, you're using three. And, and frankly, like one of them is accounting software. So maybe we don't even count that. That's amazing. And they said, yeah, everything else is just inside of our system. And we do that on purpose so that all the pieces of the software know about what all the other pieces of the software are doing. They can talk to each other, not only talk to each other, which an API between software could allow, but they can control each other. And this part over here that talks to the consumer can tell this part over here that talks to you know, production can talk to this part over here that talks to the drivers and it can coordinate all of that activity. And so the outcome of that coordination is that there's no latency anywhere in the system. Nobody's waiting for anything. No food is ever waiting. No driver's ever waiting. No cook is ever waiting. That means that utilization among the labor and among the equipment is higher. That means that profitability is higher. It also means that the consumer can get free delivery with no menu markups and their delivery cost is still only 7%. It's amazing. What? It's <laughs> like, amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. So are, when I heard are, all of what that. Are average, what are average third-party deliveries at if you look? Um, third-party delivery costs, if you're looking at just the delivery, not yeah. the yeah. sort of listing fee, uh, if you were to do white label, it's probably 10 to 15%, depending on yep. what you negotiate. Yep. Yeah. So they're running you know, 30 to 50% less than that, which is, I mean, it's incredible. So incredible. when he pitched you this opportunity, what, 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 what went through your mind? Well, have, have, you, been a a C, have you been a CEO? Have you been a chief executive officer? I haven't. I've been a COO. I've never been a CEO. Okay. So okay. I, number one, you know, can you, can I do this? It turns out, it turns out, yes, you can, right? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, but you know, the opportunity to work with Chris and the rest of the team, they're all just as smart, if not smarter than he is like just incredible, incredible people and all super nice. Um, they all live, um, I guess they're scattered around the country, but the nucleus of them are in Indianapolis. And I have discovered that everyone in Indianapolis is super, super nice. So that was, um, that was certainly a plus, but to me, 
thinking about the opportunity, certainly in the short term with ghost kitchens, um, there are so many of these integrated multi-concept ghost kitchens that have emerged during the pandemic. Yep. Basically a whole bunch of people closed their front of house because they had to. And they said, okay, to survive, I'm going to go all delivery. Okay. That's not enough revenue. I'm going to launch multiple concepts. And then we emerged from the pandemic and there was labor shortage. And they thought, well, why reopen the front of house if I don't have to? And so there are more of these multi-concept ghost kitchens around America than you would ever guess that are serving, you know, primarily, if not exclusively delivery with a bunch of different brands operating out of a single kitchen. And they're all using terrible software to make it happen. So as a result, they're very dependent on the third parties, which of course reduces their margins and or increases their price to the consumer, which then you know reduces their uh, number of orders or transactions from the consumer. Or they're trying to kludge together software. I shouldn't say it's bad software. It's very good software. It's just not meant for this purpose. Yep. And so when they put, say, Toast, which is an incredible company and such great software for its purpose, when they put that together with, say, Lunchbox and then you know somebody else for KDS and somebody else for a um, kiosk and you know they start adding all these things together. Each one of them are great pieces of software in and of their own right for the thing they're meant to do. Mm -hmm. But when they put them together and say, "Hey, what I want you to do is be a tech stack to enable exclusively delivery," the system breaks and consumers, um, as as Carl and I say in the new book, which is Delivering the Digital Restaurant, The Path to Digital Maturity, no amount of discounting will ever overcome friction. So if you are thinking, I want to get my third-party customer to become a first-party customer, and I'm just going to send them offers and hope that they do it eventually, they might try it once to get that deal. But if your system sucks and it's hard, they're not going to come back. You have to make it as easy as ordering on the third party, or they are not going to switch to your first party system. So what the system does is it makes a better experience for the consumer, a more profitable restaurant. And by the way, a special bonus, the drivers are also happier because the drivers are making more money than they do on the third parties. I mean, win, 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 right? You don't see that very often. Stop there because that's incredible. And then there's a whole future story that I'll get into in a minute. Well, can you, before I let you go off this topic is give me a, a holistic, because we always in the United States, shocking, we talk about the United States all the time, but you know, what I love so much about delivering the digital restaurant is you talk about the global ghost kitchen economy, what's happening in India, what's happening in China, like things that are happening in London that we don't even realize and that we take for granted that we probably are a couple steps behind a lot of these places. Can you, can you give us some, some insights into what's happening globally on the on the real estate on the delivering the digital restaurant side yeah absolutely so there are more uh, ghost kitchens internationally than there are here in the u.s and why is that it's because here in the u.s we have about six hundred thousand restaurants probably a million kitchens if you include b and i like stadiums and corporate dining and things like that and when you have an installed base that large, it doesn't make sense to just chuck it all and start over, right? Like, why would you build all new kitchen infrastructure when you already have a million kitchens? Yep. But in emerging countries, developing countries, they don't have that. And so as the consumer changes from eating at home to eating food that's prepared in a restaurant, it makes a lot more sense just to build the future version of that restaurant. And part of that is ghost kitchens that are delivery optimized. Part of that's better technology. Part of that is more electric based cooking methods. Part of that is more automation. And so a lot of these videos that you see of a fully automated kitchen or automated servers or things like that often come from foreign countries yep. because the adoption of those things is greater there. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's fascinating to me, knowing where we are in 2023 and moving beyond because these lessons and stories are so accessible. So because of YouTube and TikTok and podcasts and, and blogs and all the things that we have access to, it's no longer difficult to have conversations like this and to learn about what other restaurant leaders are doing in other places and go, why are they, wait, 
we can do that here. Wait, why, why are they doing that? Why can't, what's preventing us? You know, back to the asking the questions. It's how can we ask more questions, but better questions. And then once we do ask those questions, who are the technology partners that are going to help us achieve those goals? As somebody that's interviewed so many different leaders across the technology landscape and restaurant landscape, what lessons have you learned from the best organizations that you're trying to implement um, at Empower? Well, I would say on the restaurant side, the biggest thing is being willing to embrace the change and let go of the way that things work. Nostalgia. So, yeah, the most <laughs> successful digital restaurants, when I think about Starbucks, Panera, Chick-fil-A, Chipotle, Wingstop, and now latecomer to the party, but getting there, McDonald's, right? These yeah, guys yeah, absolutely. have- they fully embraced, like, look, this is where consumers are. We need to figure out how to make our restaurants match consumer expectations. Rather than, I think some restaurants are a little bit more resisting, like, ooh, we're not sure if we like third-party delivery. We're not sure if we like delivery in general. It really messes up our operational flow. We've got problems with margins. We want to get people back into the restaurant when they're focused on those things, um, if they're not a fully, you know, high high service dine in restaurant, they tend to view the whole digital delivery thing as a threat to that core business, rather than wow, that's where the consumer's moving. We need to figure out how to make our business look like that. Um, I absolutely love listening to Noah Glass at Olo. I love his yes. concept of the digital entirety. I think that is fantastic because I think what he's describing to restaurants is, hey, don't tie digital exclusively to delivery. It doesn't have to be. Your entire business should be digital. And you know, when we visited your restaurant in San Diego, you had digital ordering at table. You had yeah. digital pay at table. Fantastic, right? Because that way you know the customer, you get the data, you know what they're ordering, what their behavior is, how often they come see you, things like that. But the consumer, guess what? Is also getting a much easier experience. They don't have to wait for the server. They don't wonder how to do things. They just, okay, well, here's the QR code. Click, click, click. Got what I want. Paid. So easy. And I think when... Uh, we embrace where the consumer's headed and their expectations and say, how do I apply this to my entire business? Not just, you know, put it in this little segment over here called delivery. Uh, I think we do a wonderful thing. So where do you find the time to not only write a second book, but also run a software company and then go and speak on all these stages and figure out how to run the Monday Minute podcast, which is a incredible podcast uh, that you do with Carl. We'll put a link in the show notes. But where do you find the time to tell these stories and aggregate these lessons? Yeah, well, first of all, I think Carl, honestly, like, <laughs> <laughs> he is... He is Don't give him that much credit. <laughs> yeah, he is the most organized person I know, and there is no way I would have ever written the first book, much less the second one without Carl. Um, he just, he is very good at, at driving toward completion and getting things done. Um, same thing with the Monday Minute. You know, when we started the podcast, we did it with me, like sort of kicking and screaming, saying, I do not want to do this. <laughs> and him saying, no, it's great. People are totally going to listen to it. And putting it together and figuring out how to do it and all the software required and all those things. So he is just incredibly gifted at um, action and making things happen and operations. And um, he creates time in my day because of that. So hats off to Carl, um, for sure. And then, you know, all these things are all related. And for me, you know, I have to understand what's going on in the world in order to run a software company. And because of writing the book, I think the second book, when I saw Empower, I saw what it could be. So that's the second part of the story. I mean, it's it's amazing right now for a integrated multi-concept ghost kitchen. Absolutely amazing tool for that. But as I look forward to what it could become, uh, it really, to me, is the software that unlocks automation in the restaurant. So when I think of a Tesla and why it's so far ahead on self-driving, well, it's because it's all electric 
and it's much easier to control an all electric thing than a combustion thing. Yeah. And number two, it's got software that was purpose built for self-driving. And then they, of course, you know, had to work backwards in the regulatory environment that they found themselves in, but it's built with the self-driving in mind. And when you look at all the other car companies, they're starting with a combustion engine and they are adding pieces of self-driving as they go, right? They're saying, okay, I'm going to have lane keeping assist. I'm going to have blind spot warnings. I'm going to have, um, you know, uh, dynamic cruise control, whatever the little element is that, yes, those pieces are required to get to self-driving, but they're not all tied together in the same way because they aren't starting at the end and working backwards. They're starting where we are and working forwards. And empowered Del delivery to me is a software that is starting at the end and working backwards. And as it is integrated with an electric kitchen, you will be able to have the software brain that's controlling the kitchen as well as the uh, hardware that's executing a lot of things. And today that's really preventing us from having more automation in a restaurant, right? I mean, when you're trying to cook on a stovetop that is gas, it is incredibly hard to change the temperature of that or to move a pan on and off the flame to keep the temperature of the pan correct, unless you physically have a person there who knows what they're doing, right? And over time, as we switch to more electric, the software is going to be able to talk to that and say, do this, change that, right? And it's going to be able to better figure out how to automate. And we need that in this industry, right? We have a labor shortage that's ongoing. Labor costs are getting very high. And I don't mean to scare people and say, you know, automation is going to take jobs inside of the restaurant industry. What I mean to say is it's going to make the jobs that remain there more productive, happier, focused on the things that only humans can do. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited about the automation of removing mundane tasks. I mean, the fact of, I mean, I say it all the time, but it's the fact that people walk into our restaurant with a point of sale in their pocket, yet so many restaurants force the skilled labor of a server to take their order, which might mess up the order to send it to the kitchen when ultimately like we can just communicate directly to the kitchen and send out that right. order. So it yeah. is, it is a very exciting time, but I do want to go back to, you know, those awkward moments of being a publisher and now being a media company yourself, because that is the essence of this show that we're hoping to encourage not just CEOs of companies, but it doesn't matter where you are in the hospitality business to tell your story and to understand that however you feel about TikTok or LinkedIn or Instagram, there's people there, there's attention there, and the work that you're doing matters and never underestimate who's watching that work. Can you talk about kind of your aha moment when you start publishing on LinkedIn, the Monday Minute, and you start to see the impact that it's getting shared literally around the globe. I mean, it's unbelievable when I see, you know, these newsletters and how many people are engaged because you can't even, there's no possible way unless you have automation, you know, personalized automation to respond to all of these global thought leaders that are engaging in the content that you and Carl are putting out. Yeah, I mean, it. it's really been incredible. And I, I full disclosure, not only am I a, a nerd, I'm an introvert as well. Well, thank you. And, yes. And so for me, um, you know, being very public on, uh, you know, a podcast like this or commenting on, on LinkedIn, things like that were very, very, frankly, difficult for me. Um, my husband's been doing it for years. Uh, it turns out that he's um, kind of a, a big deal in the world of hypnosis. And I always thought it was the strangest, like, why are we doing a video? Like, I can't, we just go to lunch. Like, what, what are you doing? And um, so he laughs all the time now because now I'm doing it. And it was a very uncomfortable transition uh, um, to start fantastic. talking. Yeah. Start talking out loud about what I'm seeing, what I'm doing, what I'm observing, what I'm thinking about. Uh, and, you know, I read on LinkedIn, a really good tip um, for anyone who's thinking about starting this, which is the algorithms are amazing. And if your content sucks, no one's ever going to see it. So don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> yes. Don't even worry about it. You put out something bad, no one will see it. Or maybe a few people, you know, your, your trusted inner circle that likes everything you do, like your mom. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, most people won't see it. So you, you can just experiment and try and put things out there and see. And then what happens, what starts to happen is people you don't know 
people who are third plus degree connections away from you, people who live in countries you've never been to start commenting on what you're saying and start reaching out to you and you make friends online, which is absolutely incredible. And uh, when you get to meet them in real life, when they've only known them on the internet, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And to know that what you are putting out there is helping someone in a place you've never even been to is yeah. just, it's remarkable. Yeah, I think that's why I'm so excited about the show and the opportunity to have conversations like this with, you know, the the best of the best in the space and leaders like yourself that are willing to be vulnerable, um, because it does take vulnerability to put your thoughts and ideas um, about business, about ghost kitchen, about life on the internet. But when you do, and then you go to, you know, these conferences and you see somebody pull you over and go, hey, Meredith, I saw that post that you did. You're like, wait, who are you and how do I know you? But then you start a conversation. Like they feel like they're talking to a friend and they feel like they've heard you speak your truth. Yeah. You know, yep. so it's a completely different conversation. And that's something that, you know, we encourage all of the listeners out there to, to have the courage because nobody else, you know, you can have an incredible PR team. You can have, you know, incredible product, incredible, you know, be so good. They can't ignore you. Everyone's going to come and tell your story. Well, ultimately, the best companies on earth, the top leaders and everyone in their organization, they celebrate what they do online. You know, that's why we love working with Toast is that they understand from Chris Comparato all the way down to the, you know, from Steve and Aman, everybody understands that like they need to be top of mind on all the different platforms. And that's how they how that's how they'll continue to win. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it turns out if you don't tell your own story, other people either ignore it or worse, tell it for you. And (laughs) they make things up about you that maybe are not the way that you would say it. Right. And it's important to put out uh, your own point of view and your own uh, understanding of both yourself, your company, what you're doing so that uh, everyone in the world knows what you do and why you do it. And I'll uh, I'll leave with a quick uh, a quick story of of exactly that. And if you think that your story doesn't matter, the most covered people, the most covered couple on earth, got a hundred million dollars from Netflix to tell their story in their words using a smartphone. And that's Harry and Meghan. So <laughs> Harry and Meghan literally put out a Netflix documentary, get a hundred million dollars, and the content, the true content of the truth, is them on their smartphone talking about their experiences about, you know, leave, leaving the Royal family coming over to America. So it's like, it, if it's that important for them, it's important for everybody, which is, that is uh, true. Although I don't think anyone would pay a hundred million dollars to hear my story. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. I'll be honest. Um, I'm, I'm super interesting, but I'm not that interesting. Well, we're, um, we're- we're just getting started. Um, but for for people that are listening, we do a, a every Wednesday and Friday on the app, social audio app Clubhouse. We have a digital hospitality room. So listeners of this show, um, wherever you are listening in the world, your story matters wherever you are in the hospitality space. If you're a content creator, a food influencer, a restaurant owner, please join us on the app. Um, that's every Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Meredith has been on the app. Carl has shown up on the app. We have incredible, all of our guests, so many of the guests that we've had on this show um, will end up in those rooms. So please join us on those rooms. Um, But I wanted to give you an opportunity, Meredith, this is an entrepreneur. Thankfully, they give us a stage to reach millions of people. Is there anyone on your team that you would like to give a shout out to somebody that's gone above and beyond? Oh my goodness. Well, we already talked about Carl, who is Uh, amazing. Carl Carl got enough love. And speaking of that, we're going to put in a link in the show notes to the new book, but this is Delivering the Digital Restaurant. We'll put the website on there so you can order both books. Um, When is the newest book going to be out? This book should be out at the beginning of February. It is in its, its final details right now. And it is also called Delivering the Digital Restaurant, but the subtitle is The Path to Digital Maturity. Um, and is a companion book to the first one. The first one we think of as why all this stuff is happening yep. and what exactly is happening. A lot of stories, as you said, with um, executives who are leading the change. The second book is a little bit more about how. So what specifically as a restaurateur should you be doing and in what order do you do it? Because there's so much. If you try to do it all at once, it feels a little bit overwhelming. 
Um, and then we talk a lot about um, this whole future, what we call it, yum, future back idea, right? So if you were to start with the end in mind, like the Tesla example and design backwards, what do you get? Um, I think that you get cluster truck running on empower delivery software, um, yeah. Yeah. maybe a little bit more automated version of that, more electric version of that. Um, absolutely. Um, and uh, another spoiler for you, we are changing the name of the Monday Minute. Oh, what's it going to be? We are going to call it the Digital Restaurant. It d makes sense. ABB yeah, I know. always be, <laughs> always be so branding. Obvious. It should be. It should <laughs> yeah. be the Digital Restaurant. He's Wait, so, so I, I, I have a question for you. So the subtitle, <laughs> The Path to Digital Maturity, can mm -hmm. a restaurant be digitally mature? Well, that is the question, right? Aren't we always, always asking questions and always innovating yes. and always going somewhere else? Probably, but certainly you can take baby steps and then uh, you can like take it. more advanced steps and head okay. toward digital maturity. No question. So who's the um, shout out to? So shout out on the team, the entire team at Empower Delivery, as I said, is absolutely incredible, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Dan McFadden, who is our CTO and co-founder. Um, and really, I think the brain behind how the kitchen brain should work. And one thing I have discovered about software engineers that I did not know um, as I've come into this role is that they have to understand absolutely everything in the real world in order to code it into the virtual world, um, which I guess, again, makes sense when you say it out loud, but um, just an incredible um, amount of intelligence required to be able to understand everything from how inventory works to how accounting works to how, you know, driver uh routing works, all of those things um, must understand them in the real world in order to be able to make the software do it. So very, very incredible there. And where, uh, if somebody's listening to this, where can they best connect with you and uh, empower delivery as well as uh, get the book? Yeah. So you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn as a great place to do it. Uh, and then for empower delivery, info at empower.delivery is a great place to reach us. Uh, the book uh, current book a, and the new one will be available on Amazon uh, is the easiest way to find that. Um, we also do sell it uh, direct the first one on deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com. So through all those ways, you can find me. Uh, if you can't track me down through one of those, then I, I don't I don't know what to say. I guess <laughs> I'll hold we'll on Clubhouse. I don't if know. You can, if you can't get a hold of Meredith, <laughs> let me know. Send me a message. But yeah, if you guys yeah. want to... If you want to reach out to me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. And that's on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all the platforms, Clubhouse. Um, we are grateful that you listen to this show. We appreciate that. Please share it with a friend. We're grateful, Meredith, for your time, um, your expertise, your knowledge. We're, we can't wait to see what you guys build in 2023 and beyond. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting year. I, I couldn't be more excited for the, the hospitality industry and for all the leaders that now because of all these tools, because of storytelling, we get to share ideas and, and really make, make quick changes and, you know, start to get involved in things that we were excited about and um, move our businesses forward in ways that we we've never thought imaginable. So thank you, Meredith. Um, thank you all for listening. As always, stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Thank you guys. Thanks we'll catch you next me. week. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. 
I will get you the link to the right toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about toast, you implemented toast, you did a toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your toast story with us. DM me today to learn more and be sure to check out toast.